fire away. Go. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, to the New York City Category Theory Seminar. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Jens Hemelar uh, uh, tonight, this evening. Uh, I, why don't you uh, tell us uh, a thing or two about yourself, Jens? Okay. Uh, um, so I um, am a postdoc at the University of Antwerp in uh, Belgium. Um, <clears throat> And I work on uh, topos theory and uh, applications on uh, concrete problems in uh, number theory or algebra or geometry. Oh, thank you. And, um, <laughs> where, where, did you, where did you do your degree and where did you do your undergraduate and, and where were you born? Um, <clears throat> I have to translate. I, I was born in Ghent, which, where is, uh, which is where I are, uh, where I am currently um, at home. Uh, and then I uh, studied in Ghent mathematics, and then my PhD was in Antwerp, where I also do now my uh, postdoc. And who is your thesis advisor? Uh, it was uh, Liv Lebrun. Very nice. Well, take it away, uh, Jens. I'll let you. We may as well. I think we should begin. It's uh, what time is it? Hmm. It's. It's time. Yeah, okay. Go okay. ahead. Sure. So uh, I will talk about uh, toposes of presheaves on a monoid and their points. So a toposes of presheaves on a monoid is also a project that I'm currently working on uh, with Morgan Rogers from the University of Insubria in Como. Um, so feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions uh, during the talk. So uh, first, what is a Grotendieck topos? Um, I will uh, exclusively uh, work with uh, Grotendieck toposes here. So it's a category of sheaves on a small category C uh, equipped with the Grotendieck topology J. So uh, as an example, you can take the category of sets by which I mean uh, a fixed category of sets uh, even if you have multiple categories of sets uh, according to your uh, foundations, then uh, you pick only uh, one of them. And this is uh, then a Grotendieck topos. Um, and this you take as base topos for all other uh, Grotendieck toposes over it. Um, another example is uh, sheaves on a topological space. Um, and then you have also. Uh, for a scheme X, you can take the small etal topos of, uh, over this scheme. Um, there are also uh, gro etal toposes, which are the big versions. But uh, for these ones, you have to be a bit more careful because uh, sometimes these are not uh, really growth and dig toposes uh, according to the strict definition given here. Um, and then another example is the category of G sets for G a group. Um, you can take either uh, left G sets or right G sets. Uh, this is the same thing because a group is uh, isomorphic to its opposite. And uh, we will take uh, right G sets here because then uh, right G sets correspond to pre sheaves on the category G. Uh, and then another example is the category of directed graphs. So these are the kind of examples that I'm thinking of. Okay, um, so some properties of toposes that uh, are uh, useful in this setting. Uh, toposes have all colimits and limits, and uh, colimits commute with uh, pullbacks in uh, this sense here. Um, so uh, pullback uh, preserves colimit, which means that if you glue things together, then this is a stable under base change. And also another property is uh, every morphism in a, topo in a topos can be written in a unique way as an epimorphism followed by a monomorphism. So these are the properties of toposes that I uh, personally 
a thing that built a lot of geometric intuition. Uh, there are also other properties, for example, the existence of a subobject classifier, um, which is more uh, something which lives on the logical side uh, rather than the geometric side. Um, and um, I, I often think of topos in a more geometric way. So, uh, for example, if we have a topological space X, then we can identify this with the topos of sheaves on it. And uh, more generally, if we have a arbitrary growth in the topos E, then we can think of the objects in E as sheaves on this topos E. And in this way, uh, E becomes a generalized topological space. So this uh, was uh, one of the ideas, the original ideas behind toposes, that if you could define sheaves on a generalized space, then you have a lot of information about uh, what the space looks like. Um, some other geometric intuition. If you have a topological space X and there's a continuous G action on it for some uh, discrete group G, then um, there's topos of equivariant sheaves on it. So, and um, this we can think of as the formal quotient of X by G. So it's a uh, it really remembers a lot about the group action of G on X uh, and which is uh, different from the coarse quotient, which is the quotient of X by G, the space of orbits of the group action, which uh, loses a lot of information. So uh, you can think of a topos as uh, some kind of space with uh, where the points have different uh, automorphisms. Um, so a bit like uh, is the case with stacks in algebraic geometry, it's a bit similar to that. So a special case of growth leak toposes are pre sheaf toposes. So this is a category of, uh, of the form pre sheaves on C, for C a small category, and the pre sheaves on C are exactly the uh, functors from the opposite category of C to the category of sets. And in particular, we can take a monoid, which is a small category with one object. Then um, this can alternatively be described as a set together with the multiplication action, which, uh, which is associative and as a unit. And um, we will then consider pre sheaf toposes on this monoid, which is a small category with one object. So these are the toposes that uh, will have our attention. Uh, then uh, geometric morphisms. Geometric morphism is an adjunction between uh, these two uh, Grothendieck toposes with the left adjoint preserving finite limits. Uh, you can just ask that uh, F upper star preserves co-limits and finite limits, and then the right adjoint automatically exists. Um, and F is called essential if uh, F upper star has a further left adjoint uh, F lower shriek. And this definition is anal analogous to topology, because in topology, if you have a continuous map, then you also get an adjunction like this, where the, uh, the left adjoint is the inverse image functor, where you take an open set of X and you send it to the inverse image, which is an open set of Y by definition of a continuous function. Um, there's also a base topos uh, for the Grothendieck toposes. So there is a unique geometric morphism to the category of sets. Um, and here, gamma upper star of S is the constant sheaf of S, and gamma lower star of, uh, of an object E of the topos E is uh, the set of global sections of E, uh, which is the same thing as morphisms from the terminal object to E. And uh, that's why, uh, at least, 
Morgan Rogers and I call this the global sections geometric morphism. I don't know how widespread this name is. Um, then uh, points of a topos. These are um, uh, geometric morphisms from the topos of sets to E, to the topos E. Um, and uh, there are uh, toposes that uh, don't even have any points. So uh, there doesn't exist such a geometric morphism from sets to E. Um, but if they do exist, and there are enough of them, then uh, you can really do so often uh, very concrete calculations and uh, compute the complete uh, category of points. So um, if P is a point, then we can uh, look at the uh, P upper star of, of an object E. And this is uh, called the stock of E at P. And then P lower star S of a set is the skyscraper sheaf on uh, S at P. So this is the name that is used in algebraic geometry. And then the, uh, in the category of points, uh, we can take also define a morphism of points from P to Q as a natural transformation from P upper star to Q upper star. So uh, we will later see why we take this convention. You could also define it using a, a natural transformation from P lower star to Q lower star, which is the opposite convention. Um, but uh, this uh, convention goes uh, really well with uh, with uh, topos of soft pre sheaves over a monoid. Um, and then the notation for the category of points of, uh, of topos E is uh, here the points of, of E. So, uh, how do we compute all points of, uh, of a topos? So, even if, uh, if the topos is a topos of sheaves on the topological space, then the first guess would be that the points of the topos are exactly the same thing as elements of the topological space, but this is not the case. And um, the, the right um, proposition is that if X is topological space, then there's a bijection between isomorphism clauses of po points of uh, the topos and irreducible closed subsets of X. So each uh, element of X defines an irreducible closed subset because you can take the singleton and then take the closure of this singleton and then you get an uh, irreducible closed subset. But uh, in general, there can be uh, irreducible closed subsets that are not of this form. Um, and if every irreducible closed subset is uh, the closure of a unique point, then this unique point will be called the generic point of the irreducible closed subset. And um, then X is called a sober space. And for sober spaces, of course, by the uh, proposition above, um, there's a bijection between the points of the topos and elements of the topological space. So this is the ideal situation where you have a, a sober topological space. And luckily there are a lot of uh, examples of sober topological spaces. Uh, for example, you can take any Hausdorff space because the only irreducible closed subsets are the singletons in a Hausdorff space. And these all have a generic point, namely the element of the singleton itself. Um, but also in uh, algebraic geometry, if you have the spectrum of a ring, then every irreducible closed subset has a generic point. Um, uh, other uh, examples are uh, locally Hausdorff spaces, such as the line with double origin. So this is not um, a Hausdorff space, but it is just two Hausdorff spaces glued together. And this, this is also a sober space. Uh, the Sierpinski space is uh, also a sober space. You have uh, two locally closed subsets, and these uh, 
have both have a generic point. Um, and uh, there are some non-examples as well. For example, if you take the infinite set with the indiscrete topology, then um, there are only two uh, irreducible, there's only one irreducible closed subset, which is the whole space. And every point in the space is a generic point. So it, a generic point is not unique. And then uh, you can also look at the infinite set with a cofinite topology. Um, and this is uh, also not a sober space because you can look at the complete space. This is a, an irreducible uh, closed subset, but it doesn't have a generic point. There is no point that is contained in every open set. Mm. And of course, if you add an add additional point, which is the generic point for this uh, topological space, then uh, you get the kind of space that you get in algebraic geometry. For example, if the infinite set is countable, then this infinite set with cofinite topology with a generic point added is the spectrum of the ring of integers. Um, Okay, so each topological space X has a soberification, X hat. And this is a sober space such that the toposes of sheaves on these two spaces are the same thing. Um, and how do you construct this soberification? Well, it's a bit the same as I said before. If you don't have a generic point, you just add it. And if there are, um, if an irreducible closed subset has multiple generic points, then you identify these uh, multiple generic points. So um, what happens is you have a topological space X, which is a Morita equivalent to another space X hat, in the sense that the topos of sheaves are, um, are equivalent to each other. But uh, X hat is sober, so points of the topos correspond to elements of X hat. Okay, uh, so now uh, we looked at uh, top, uh, points of uh, toposes of sheaves on a topological space. And now the question is, if you have a monoid, what are the points of the topos of pre-sheaves on this monoid? Um, and this topos of pre-sheaves on the monoid also has an alternative description as a category of right M sets. Um, you could look at left M sets as well. There's also a topos, but there's then the topos of pre-sheaves on M up, which is uh, more difficult to write. Mm. Okay, so what was my motivation to look at this? at the uh, topos of pre-sheaves on monoids. Um, it was uh, the arithmetic site by uh, Kon and Konzani. And what they did was uh, they constructed an, uh, a topos, which was the topos of pre-sheaves on the monoid of natural numbers uh, under multiplication. And they equipped this topos with a structure sheaf which is a sheaf of semi-rings. And then they use this uh, to get some uh, nice uh, relations to uh, number theory in their, uh, in their approach to uh, the Riemann hypothesis. Um, and one uh, remarkable thing that they proved is that the points of the topos are classified up to isomorphism by a double quotient. Uh, and this double quotient uh, features uh, the Adels, which uh, are uh, a ring appearing in number theory. And here the profinite integers, which is also something uh, which, uh, which appears in number theory. So uh, I won't talk much about uh, Adels here. Uh, it's just what I want to convey is that it's a rather simple monoid, but then the result is a much more complicated uh, space. For example, 
the natural numbers are a commutative monoid and even a free commutative monoid on, uh, on infinitely many generators. But still, it's a countable monoid. But here, the points, this is an, uh, this double quotient is an uncountable set. So there are uncountable, un uncountably many points up to isomorphism. So some questions, this monoid is just a free commutative monoid on the prime numbers. Why do we still get uncountably many points? And the second question is the relation to the Adele's uh, coincidence. And if you look carefully at the original proof by Conning Konzani, then you already see that the relation is not really a coincidence. So the way they prove it already uh, gives a good link to uh, the number theory. But another thing you can do to convince you that the, the it's not a coincidence that the Adels appear is you can look at other rings uh, that appear in number theory. So what you can do in number theory is you can take an imaginary quadratic field with the class number one. And M is then the monoid of non-zero elements in the ring of integers of this uh, uh, quadratic field. And then you can look at the points of the pre sheaf topos on this monoid. And then what uh, Aurelien Sagny proved is that again, you get the double quotient with the Adels, but this time the Adels of the field K instead of the Adels of the rational numbers. So it's uh, functorial in some sense that it also works for other, uh, for other base fields. And the idea is that the points of, okay, uh, is there a question? Okay, so uh, you can interrupt me in any case. Yeah, um, does that have to do with the prime factorization and the fact that you have um, class number one in that case, where you can sort of write it as a, um, a free monoid on the, the primes? Yes, um, so it's almost a free monoid with the exception that you have to look at the units as well. So um, there's a unit group, which is not necessarily trivial. So in this first case, the natural numbers don't have any uh, invertible elements uh, other than one itself. But here you have uh, invertible elements um, of your uh, ring okay of the ring of integers so that's i yes that's the only difference between these two monoids but the idea is that the proof is different in the two cases so what you do in the proof is um you look at the you show that the points of this uh, topos correspond to non-zero uh, submodules of K. Um, so the toposes are almost the same. Um, and also these, uh, these double quotients are almost the same or the same, I'm not sure. Uh, I think they are exactly the same. Um, but the way you look at it and the proofs are uh, very different. Okay, so um, this is uh, just a motivation for me to, uh, I didn't understand at the time the proofs very well that were given by uh, Conning Konzani and by Aurelien Sagny. Uh, I even didn't know about Adels before I uh, looked at these papers. So, um, so this looked to me very mysterious and uh, that's why I got interested in uh, computing points of different toposes of pre sheaves on a monoid. And uh, one, one case, for example, that was uh, suggested to me by uh, my PhD advisor, Clive Lebrun, was to look at the monoid of two times two integer matrices. So instead of looking at uh, just natural numbers, 
you look at two times two uh, matrices over the integers uh, under multiplication. And the question is, do you then again get something with the uh, ADELs? Uh, and uh, regarding your question, um, so here in this case, you could think maybe it has something to do with the fact that these uh, monoids are almost almost free monoids. But if you look at two times two integer matrices, this is not uh, a free monoid again, uh, not at all. So uh, if you then prove that for uh, the two times two integer matrices, you get again get something with Adels, then it really is not a coincidence anymore. Mm. At least that that was what was needed for me to convince myself that it wasn't a coincidence. Okay, uh, so how do you uh, compute these points? So first uh, strategy, which was uh, used by uh, Conan Konzani and uh, Arlien Sagny. So is, this is strategy is by looking at flat functors. So uh, if C is a small category, then the points of the pre sheaf topos on it correspond to functors that are flat. Um, this is a, a special case of the Diaconescu's theorem. And these are the condition for flatness. So um, <laughs> there are uh, three conditions that are uh, easy to verify if you have a specific flat functor but it's not so easy using these conditions to write down all the flat functors. So for uh, in the case that uh, C, the category C is a monoid, then uh, again, you, this correspond to flat functors, but flat functors from M to the category of sets are in this case, exactly the left M sets. And when are they flat? Well, they have to be non-empty they have to be locally cyclic. So if you have two elements in the set, then you can take the both X and Y are contained in the cyclic subset generated by an element Z. And then there's also something which is in the semi-group literature called condition E, uh, which is uh, the translation of the third condition that we saw on the previous slide. So the conditions become a bit easier for uh, in the case of monoids. So, uh, and what's also the case is that A is flat if and only if tensoring with A preserves finite limits. Uh, this is the convention that category theorists use. Uh, in the semi-group literature, often it is said that uh, a set is flat even only if tensoring with it preserves monomorphisms. So that's a different convention. Um, we use monomorphism flat for, uh, for cases where uh, monomorphisms are preserved by tensor product. Uh, both are, of course, uh, generalizations of um, or analogies with the case of rings, where again, uh, a ring is called a module of a ring is called flat if tensoring with it preserves finite limits or monomorphisms. In the case of ring modules, these two things are uh, the same. Okay, so in a first exercise, so this is an exercise in the sense that uh, it is uh, fun to do, uh, not in the sense that it is easy, it's surprisingly difficult for such an elementary statement. So uh, let X and Y be infinite sets with uh, the cardinality of X smaller than the cardinality of Y. Prove that the set of functions from X to Y is flat as a right uh, M set where M is the monoid of anamorphisms of X. So uh, this uh, right action is by precomposition. And because these are all flat uh, right and X sets, this means that the category of points or the pre sheaf topos on the opposite monoid is not small because for this monoid, there will be 
um, a proper class number of flat left M sets. And also the flat, uh, flat M sets can be of arbitrary large uh, size. So this is an exercise you can uh, do by just using these properties of the um, of uh, flat M sets, this, char this characterization. So this shows that this uh, characterization can be used to show that a given uh, object of uh, a given right and X set is flat, but it doesn't help to write down all the flat rights and X sets. Uh, we don't have a nice description of all the flat uh, sets here. So now the case of the arithmetic site. Uh, this is from the original uh, work by Colin Konzan. So what they did was, if you have a flat left uh, end set for n the natural numbers, then you can take uh, element z for every two elements x and y, such that x and y are contained in the uh, ideal generated by z. Uh, and then you can define an addition on x and y. Uh, so x plus y is defined as m plus m prime z. So this is the definition that we, you would guess if you uh, look at the distributivity rule. And this uh, addition is uh, well-defined as uh, shown by Conan Konzani. And further, they show that A with this addition is then isomorphic to uh, the intersection of L and the positive rationals for L and non-zero subgroup of the rational numbers. So that's the most important step in their proof that you, you have just a flat left uh, end set, but you can equip it with an additional structure of the addition. Because of course the monoid has an additional structure of addition because it is the monoid of uh, coming from a ring. Okay. Um, so an alternative uh, approach is uh, by looking at uh, int completions. So, and here we use the statement that the category of points of a pre sheaf topos on C is equivalent to the int completion of the opposite category of C. And this is uh, by definition, the category of formal filtered colimits, which has morphisms from uh, the colimit of XIs to the colimit of YJs. Um, well, you can bring the uh, co-limits outside of the home. Um, so the morphisms in this category are uh, completely determined by this formula. And if A is a locally finitely presentable category, which, is, which means that every uh, object can be written as a formal filtered co-limit of finitely presentable uh, objects, then A is precisely the incompletion of the category of finitely presentable um, objects of this category. So how can we use this to uh, for pre-sheaved topos moments? First, some examples. If you look on, at pre-sheaves on the opposite of the category of commutative, finitely presented commutative rings, then the category of points is a category of rings. Um, and for example, the category of points for the object classifier pre-sheaves on the opposite of the category of finite sets, then you get the category of sets. So how can we apply this ID for uh, topos of pre-sheaves on a monoid? So first we embed the monoids in a, in a locally finitely presentable category. For example, if M is the integers on the multiplication, then M we can look at M as the endomorphism monoid of the abelian group Z. So the, the free on, on one generator. And this is a finitely presented object in the locally finitely presentable category of abelian groups. And then the category of points of the 
topos of pre-sheaves on M is then the full subcategory of the category of abelian groups, consisting of those abelian groups that are filtered colimits of copies of this object. So um, instead of computing literally formal uh, filtered colimits, we embed M into a category where, um, where the colimits, the filtered colimits are automatically uh, formal filtered colimits. Um, so then we show that the uh, points of the topos are precisely corresponding to subgroups of the rational numbers. Because these uh, are the groups that can be written as a union of, um, of copies of C. And here are some other cases. Um, so the original case by uh, Conan Konzani was the net non-zero natural numbers on the multiplication. And then you can use this to uh, this approach to show that the category of points are the non-trivial ordered subgroups of the rational numbers and injective morphisms of ordered groups. And similarly, if you add a zero, then you get ordered subgroups of Q, uh, not necessarily non-zero. So you also have the zero subgroup and morphisms of ordered groups. The morphisms do not have to be injective anymore. And uh, here are some other examples. For example, uh, if you take uh, n times n matrix over, over the integers, this is the endomorphism monowidth of z to the n, the free, mon free abelian group on n generators. And then the filtered colimits of this uh, particular object are the subgroups of q to the n. And uh, the morphisms between them are uh, group morphisms. Uh, another approach is by using uh, equivariant sheaves. So uh, this is a more geometric uh, approach, whereas the, the earlier strategy was more categorical. So if you have a topological space X equipped with a continuous G action with a G discrete group, uh, then we can assume that X has a basis of open subsets that we call B. And we want that G acts transitively on B. So uh, up to translation by an element of G, there is really only one basic open subset. So what happens now is we can apply the comparison lemma, which says that a topos of sheaves uh, is the same thing as topos of sheaves on the basis. So G equivariant sheaves on X are the same thing as G equivariant sheaves on this basis B. And because there's only one object in B up to translation by an element of G, what will happen is that this is a category of sheaves on a category with one object. So on a monoid. Um, but of course, there's also still a growth in the topology on it. Um, we don't know uh, a priori what uh, growth in the topology changes, but we do know what the monoid M is. This uh, corresponds to the unique object of B, and the endomorphisms of this uh, object of B are precisely the elements of the group that send U into itself. GU is contained in U. Okay, um, this doesn't help much as long as J is a, a growth unique topology, which is different from the pre shift topology. But we can ask when is J, in what, in what cases is J the pre shift topology? And this is precisely the case if, if you have a cover of U by smaller. Um, open sets ui, then there is an index i such that u is uh, equal to one of the uis. 
for uh, for all open sets u and ui in in b and if this property holds then we say that b is a minimal basis of the topology so this is not something that you uh, see often for example for uh hauser spaces this is only possible if the space is discrete i think uh, but there are uh spaces for which such a minimal basis exists and these are uh, called uh, alexandrov discrete spaces and if you have a space like that and a minimal basis like that then the g equivalent chiefs on x um, are equivalent as a topos to the category of pre sheaves on m because j is the pre sheaf topology and uh, then we there is already a known description of the points of the topos of G equivalent sheaves, because then we also know the points of the topos of pre-sheaves on M. So they are given by elements uh, X in the sobrification of the topological space X, and morphisms from X to Y are elements of the group G, such that uh, X is smaller than GY. Uh, this specialization order means exactly that X is in a closure of G, Y. So suppose that we have a group and M is a submonoid. And now we want to construct a space X such that G equivalent chiefs on the space X are exactly the same thing as right M sets. So for this state, the uh, S topological space, the quotient of G by the units in M the invertible elements in M. And as basis of open subsets, you can take uh, these sets, which are the UG, which are the right multiples of the element G by elements in M. And then you can see that there is a left action by G uh, using a multiplication. And this action is continuous. And further, it also works transitively on the basis B. And it's also uh, not difficult to prove that this is really a minimal basis as well. So we are in a situation where there is a minimal basis for the topology. So we are, we here have the conclusion that the category of pre sheaves on M is a uh, category of G equivalent sheaves on the space X. So uh, now an example, the three monoids on N generators, and this we consider as a subgroup of the free group on N generators. And there's only one invertible element in M, which is uh, the, the unit one. So as the space X, we take the, uh, the elements of X will be the elements of the group G, the free group on N generators. So here is the case uh, of uh, two generators. So you can imagine this space uh, as kind of resembling the K graph. And then you can look at what the locally closed, uh, the irreducible closed subsets are of this, uh, of this space. And what happens is that um, here the points that are added at infinity in the limit, those also correspond to irreducible closed subsets because the, um, the downward closure of these points will give an uh, irreducible closed subset of the space. So the what happens is that the points of the pre sheaf topos for M the free monoid on N generators uh, these correspond to uh, words in the generators, possibly infinite, starting with an element G of the group, and then uh, X1, X2, X3, with these all uh, different uh, choice of, of the variables. Um, <laughs> and we can compute anamorphism monoids of this point. For example, if uh, X is a finite word, then you can translate it um, and multiply it by an element of G 
to get just the word, uh, the empty word corresponding to the unit one. And then the anamorphisms of these are uh, precisely the elements of the monoid. And you can also look at uh, periodic uh, infinite words or uh, eventually periodic. And then you have uh, translations by an element of the group such that you get the same uh, infinite word again, which means that in this case, anamorphisms are the integers under uh, addition. And in all other cases, there are no uh, possible anamorphisms. So the idea is that uh, with this description, more, more geometric description, you really have a good way to compute the points and the uh, anamorphism monoids of these points. So another example is the one uh, by Conan Konzani. So the monoid of natural, non-zero natural numbers on the multiplication, and these who can embed in the positive uh, rational numbers. Um, and again, one is the only invertible element. So as a space, we just take the a positive uh, rational numbers. And the open sets are the multiples, the, the natural number multiples of a rational number Q. And this uh, basic open subset is then called UQ. And in particular, U1 is uh, the monoid itself. So these are the multiples of one, which are exactly the natural numbers. So how do we compute this? So for each uh, natural number, uh, for example, uh, for six, we can take the downwards closure. So this is a subset containing uh, six, two, three, and one. And this is an irreducible closed subset. That is the closure of a point of the topological space. But there are other uh, irreducible closed subsets. For example, if you take all the powers of two, this is also downwards closed set. If, uh, if you have a power of two uh, and a divisor of this power of two, then the divisor will also be a power of two. So this gives a irreducible closed subset. But then you have to add a generic point for this irreducible closed subset. So what happens is for each of these possibilities, you have to add a generic point. For example, the generic point for, uh, for the irreducible closed subset of all powers of two, this generic point will be called two to the infinity. And uh, we have uh, other generic points like that as well. So uh, here is another picture. So you can uh, define a metric on the natural numbers such that if you uh, embed the, the natural numbers in the plane with this metric, then the closure of, this, uh, of the natural numbers will be exactly the, um, the sobrification of the natural numbers. So you will exactly add these generic points corresponding to, for example, to, to the infinity. And that's what you see happening here as well. So you can go from one to two to four to eight, and then in the limits, you will get uh, two to the infinity. And uh, this is how the relation with uh, um, with the Adels come into play. So the elements of this quotient of the finite Adels by the profinite integers are given by formal products of uh, primes with each with an exponent EP. And EP is either an integer or plus infinity. And you have that uh, exponent is uh, at least zero for almost all primes. Uh, and this is how you describe the sobrification of this uh, space of positive rational numbers. So what we get is that precis on the non-zero natural numbers on the multiplication is the same thing as equivariant sheaves on this space, uh, which is again 
the same thing as um, equivalent chiefs on this uh, quotient featuring Adele's. And you can do the same thing for um, n times n matrices over the integers. Okay, uh, so this was another more geometric strategy. And now a third strategy that I'm, uh, that is uh, based on joint work with uh, Morgan Rogers. What we did we, was we looked at etal geometric morphisms between uh, topos of pre sheaves on monoids. And uh, let's recall first what an etal geometric morphism is. So it's a geometric morphism of this form from E over X to E, where E over X is a slice category of uh, E over X. So uh, objects are morphisms from an object of E to X. And um, this geometric morphism is defined by taking F upper star to be uh, sending E to uh, E times X with a structure map to X, the projection. Uh, and the question is now, what are the etal geometric morphisms from the pre sheaves on M to pre sheaves on N? Uh, with M and N are uh, monoids. And, and why do I want to do this? Uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, for this talk, it's uh, good to point out that the points of this uh, slice topos E over X are given by pairs PX with P a point of E and X an um, element of P upper star X. So the point is that if you know the points of E, then you also know the points of E over X. Um, and then you can also describe the morphisms between these points. Um, and uh, below I used a notation for a discrete uh, op vibrations. So you can also think of the points of this uh, slice topos E over X as a discrete op vibration over the points of E corresponding to the uh, object X. So um, what I did with Morgan was uh, shown that if you have a monoid map, then uh, you can look at the induced geometric morphism from the pre sheaves on M to pre sheaves on N. Um, this uh, induced geometric morphism has as inverse image functor that you take an N set and you forget that it's an N set and you uh, just look at the M set structure. So um, if you want, if you take M times X, that is defined by uh, first applying phi to M and then multiplying with the element X. Um, and this induced geometric morphism is et al, if and only if the following three conditions are satisfied. So phi has to be injective. And then um, uh, the submonoid uh, defined by phi also has to be right factorable. So if A is in this submonoid and AB is in submonoid, then B is also in submonoid. And then another condition is that uh, for every element N in the monoid N, there is a right invertible element U such that NU is in the submonoid. So uh, we can do an example. You can look at an inclusion of the non-zero natural numbers into the non-zero integers, both uh, as monoids under multiplication. And this is surely injective. And also the second condition is verified. And then the third condition, well, you need that for every integer, there is an invertible integer such that multiplying by the, this invertible integer gives a natural number. And this is of course the case because if you have a negative integer, you can multiply by minus one to get a natural number. 
And if you have a positive integer, then you can multiply by one to get a natural number. So we have a etal geometric morphism from the pre-sheaves on the first monoids to the pre-sheaves on the second monoids. And uh, more concretely, we can write the topos of pre-sheaves on the non-zero natural numbers as in uh, slice topos of the other topos over the object X. And X is just only two elements, minus one and one. And I described the action of the non-zero uh, integers. So if you multiply by a positive integer, it does nothing. And if you multiply by a negative integer, it changes the sign. And um, what this means is we can use the description of points of the slice topos. And with this, uh, approach we get uh, we get that the points of the underlying topos of the arithmetic side pre-sheaves on the non-zero natural numbers these are pairs uh, p sigma where uh, p is a point of pre-sheaves on the non-zero integers and sigma is an element of this uh, this set x so an element of minus one or one and the points of the um, of the underlying topos of the arithmetic site were given by orders um, ordered groups. So you can think of this sigma as giving an ordering on on the group. So um, a point, the point P is a, is given by a group, and then sigma gives the ordering on this group. So uh, then the dual approach to etal geometric morphisms are uh, complete spreads. Um, and I will only give the definition of complete spreads for uh, two pre-sheave topos. So if, uh, if you have a topos of pre-sheaves on a category C, then a complete spread to this topos is a geometric morphism of the form well, it's a geometric morphism induced by a discrete op vibration. Uh, and these uh, discrete op vibrations are exactly given by functors F from C to the category of sets. Um, so a complete spreads with locally connected uh, domain correspond to functors from the category C to the category of sets. Okay, um, so for more on complete spreads, uh, these are the works uh, by Bonner and Funk that we uh, used uh, in particular. Um, so spreads and symmetric topos uh, one and two, and then the book uh, Singular Coverings of Topos were most helpful to us. Um, and by the results of Bonne, Bonne and Funk, the category of points of this uh, complete spread over the base topos pre-sheaves over N are given again by pairs, like in the etal case. And now it's pairs A and chi, where A is a flat left N set and chi is a morphism of left N sets from A to Y. So uh, every complete spread corresponds to a left end set, Y, and then uh, the points are pairs A, chi, where uh, A is a flat left end set and chi is a morphism from E to Y. And um, the situation is completely dual to the situation for etal maps. So, um, the characterization for uh, monoid maps is also the same. Again, phi has to be injective. Now the submonoid has to be left vectorable instead of right vectorable. And now there has to exist some left invertible element with a nice property instead of a right invertible element. And again, because our example was commutative, um, it dualizes to the same example. 
Uh, so this example that we gave earlier is actually also an example that gives a complete spread. Um, so this is an uh, example, which means that we can now also compute the category of points of the underlying topos of the arithmetic site uh, in this different way using uh, complete spreads. So uh, it is the complete spread corresponding to a set Y with only two elements again, minus one and one. And the action is the same, but now um, it acts on the left instead of on the right. Um, and our, we now have a different description. Points are pairs A chi with A uh, left ZNS set, which corresponds to a group. And chi is a sort of character. It's a morphism from A to this uh, set Y consisting of elements minus one and one. And this has to be a morphism of left ZNS sets. So um, the two dual approaches, et al, geometric morphisms and complete spreads give two different descriptions, which of course uh, amount to the same thing. But um, hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll find uh, more examples where, um, where the, um, where you either have an etal geometric morphism, which is not a complete spread or a, a complete spread, which is not etal. Um, we also found, we already found some examples where you have um, an etal geometric morphism between uh, topos of precious or monoids, where, which is also pure, which is the complete opposite of a complete spread. And uh, dually, we also have an example of a, a geometric morphism between precious or monoids, which is a complete spread but it's also terminally connected, which is the complete opposite of the tau. So hopefully we will get uh, more examples in the future. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I will be here for uh, questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Any questions, Jonathan, Marta? Marta, please. Yes. Um, I can see uh, the person who's speaking. Um, uh, I cannot. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, complete spreads were, in our view, the geometric counterparts of the so called Lovier distributions on a topos. So, my question is is there a special description of the points of the complete spread on the pre sheaves on a monoid? in terms of distributions of a certain kind? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't seeing you, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's this general theorem. So in this, but you are more interested in, uh, in topos of the form pre sheaves or monoid. So I was wondering if copyrights over such topos have a special, correspond to special sorts of distributions on the and what are they? Mm. Uh, that's uh, so the distributions correspond to the Complete. left M sets. Yes. Um, so I, and then you can look at uh, special distributions correspondent, for example, to the flat left M sets, which are the distributions corresponding to points. Um, but I'm not sure if this answers your question. Um, so what kind of uh, distributions are you thinking of? Right. Um, So I, I'm not sure uh, what kind of distributions uh, there would be. Um, you, you have uh, in your work, uh, you define probability distributions as those distributions that deserve the, the 
That's right. Determinate objects. Mm -hmm. uh, and these uh, correspond to, uh, to the connected MCs. Yes. Terminal object is preserved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a really nice uh, correspondence. Um, there's also a notion in the semi group uh, literature, which is a pullback flat uh, left uh, M sets, which are exactly the left M sets such that if you tensor with it, it preserves pullbacks. And then, of course, these correspond also to the distributions that preserve pullbacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, they really have uh, yeah, corresponding parts in the semi group literature. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank the speaker again. And I just want to say next week, um, we're also having an, uh, we're, we're going to have another nice uh, speaker, uh, December 15th, Samantha Jarvis is going to talk about language as an enriched category. And the week after, we're going to have Todd Trimble is going to speak. So that's the 22nd. Anyways, you're all most welcome. Martha, whatever you want to give a talk. No, 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 not, not at the moment. I'm involved in moving. Uh, not very mathematical. <laughs> no, thank you. Anyways, no. and uh, Ross Street, whenever you want, and uh, Lou, whenever you want. Anyways, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Again, thank you, Jens. It's been it's been very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night nice to everybody. To Good night. Good night. Good evening. Good night. Okay. Okay. Take care.